Thanks a lot. Good morning. It's really a pleasure to be back. I was so glad when Kevin and his crew asked me back uh, to help open the event. Um, before I get started, I'm going to tell you guys that uh, I have really fond memories of uh, the first Midwest I.O. And I wanted to do something special for you guys this time. And so what I'm about to show to you is completely new. And I developed it all myself. Um, and aside from my wife, who I want to thank for helping me pull it all together, uh, you guys are the first people to see it. And uh, that probably means it's virtually guaranteed to glitch at least once in this talk. <clears throat> especially considering it's basically just one giant demo. But we're going to just ignore all of that common uh, uh, wisdom that says you're not supposed to do live demos in crowded rooms um, and just, you know, just, just do only that. So. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're going to talk about today is partnership. And I know I'm at a software conference, but I'm talking about partnership because I think this is something we can all appreciate in our work. And there's plenty of software in this talk. It just happens to be in the medium of the talk. And I'm going to tell three stories about partnership. And I really believe in the power of stories to, to teach us things. Because you can, I'll take some things out of these stories that I think apply to the partnerships that we have in our business. But I expect you guys are going to take your own things out of these stories. And I hope you'll share some of those things with me as well. Uh, because I think these stories will mean different things to different people. The first story that we have is from the first age of exploration, of maritime exploration. It is a time of great uncertainty and exploration. Our maps are confused by the fact that it's very difficult often to know where our ships are at sea. And the locations of our vessels is often up to the judgment, the intuition, even the guess of a ship's navigator. This doesn't always work so well. In 1707, England loses four warships and 2,000 men because the admiral of that fleet correct, uh, incorrectly determines the location of the vessels. And when something like this happens, when a devastation of this magnitude happens to the British Empire, they're brought to the point of desperation. And a new board of longitude is formed and a prize is founded. The prize is 20 thousand pounds to anyone who can bring before the board a method for figuring out longitude at sea, longitude being your position from east to west on, on the globe. You see, latitude was never the problem, your position north to south. You could find latitude using an instrument like this. In fact, early mariners could find latitude with nothing but a stick and a string held in their teeth. But with a modern sextant, at least modern at the time like this, finding latitude was something that was, was quite straightforward. See, a sextant like the one I have here, which is, is a real antique, is something that you use for measuring the angles of things above the horizon. So, for example, I'm going to use my sextant here to take the reading of the altitude of the sun over the horizon. And this is the way that a mariner could figure out what time it was, something that was very valuable. Now, if instead I was trying to figure out the altitude of Polaris over the horizon without even performing a single calculation, this device would tell me exactly where I was in latitude on Earth because the altitude of Polaris is your latitude in the northern hemisphere, or quite nearly so. So it was so easy to find latitude with something like this, which every mariner had, that it's quite understandable that people thought that the solution to understanding longitude would also lie in the sky. So you may have noticed that the moon moves across the sky from east to west, just like the sun and the stars with it. But what you might not have noticed is that the moon moves a little slower than the stars. The reason why is that the moon is actually orbiting from the west to the east around the earth. Not fast enough so that it appears to go the opposite direction, but just fast enough that it appears to slip across the background of stars as it moves across the sky. So over the course of a night, and then even more so over the course of days or weeks, the stars that surround the moon change. So if you could use a sextant 
to find the angles of the moon and a reference star, and Regulus was often one that was used, then you could use the difference between those two to calculate the apparent visual distance between the moon and that star. This is the so-called lunar distance, and it's an important thing in our first story here because the lunar distance can be used to calculate your longitude. And it's really quite simple. You see, all you have to do is begin by taking into account the differences in altitude between the two bodies that you're measuring and also the apparent diameter of the moon because the moon changes its apparent diameter depending on where it is in its orbit. And there are also a few corrections you need to make due to chromatic aberration and the fact that parallax causes the moon to be seen different on Earth. You just take all of that and plug it into a few simple trigonometric equations. That's not quite right, actually. I think it's more like this trigonometric equation. And did I mention, by the way, you don't have a calculator on board the boat. Um, so in order to do trig, you need to look up all these values in a series of complicated books and tables. And, and while you're doing that, you know, the wind is blowing. And will someone please stop rocking the boat? Because I'm trying to do math here <laughs> right now. And if we'll just, okay, everyone calm down. We're going to try again. We're going to find the altitude of the moon. And then it, this always happens. Ah. So, these issues are a few of the reasons why it took even a skilled captain four hours in order to determine their longitude this way. And they often made serious mistakes. So we need an alternative. Because, honestly, the number of captains who are capable of pulling that off on a regular basis is, is pretty limited. Thankfully, very thankfully, we do have an alternative, and it's right here. You see, the sun is setting on the earth at exactly one place at any point during the day. It's sort of like the earth is a giant clock, and this line of sunset is the hand of that clock. It, in fact, moves around the earth at the rate of 15 degrees per hour, which is just, you know, 360 degrees, and there's 24 hours in the day, so it's 15 degrees per hour. So what that means is if you are out here somewhere in the middle of the ocean hoping to get back home alive, and it's the sunset right where you are right now, and you just saw the sun drop below the horizon, you know what time it is where you are, because a simple almanac tells you what time the sun is supposed to set at this time of year um, at the latitude that you're at. So if you happen to know that over here in London, that the sun set exactly two hours before, you just somehow magically knew that, then you would know that you are 30 degrees away from London because each hour is 15 degrees. So two hours earlier means that you are 30 degrees away from London. This is actually the same thing as happening to magically know that what time it is, the local time, from your point of departure as well as the time where you are now. And I just showed you we can find the time by using a sextant. So you just need to know the time of the place that you left. So you're just, of course, thinking, well, bring a clock with you. What's the big deal? Well, the problem is that the clocks of the time don't function well on a rocking boat and in the salty sea air. For one thing, they use pendulums. And so they're about the worst thing possible to try to use on a rocking boat to keep time. So... What I've laid out for you here are the two main options for determining the longitude at sea. And I want to now introduce you to the two gentlemen who are the leading proponents of each of these methods. So, over here on the left is Neville Maskelyne. He is a member of the British elite intelligentsia. He is a master astronomer, formally trained and educated. And he is really all in on the lunar distance method. He's one of the greatest proponents of it. Over here on the right, the challenger, is a country carpenter by the name of John Harrison who taught himself a little bit of science in his spare time and he fixes clocks in his spare time as well. It really does not feel like a fair fight, does it? <laughs> the brilliant astronomer and the country clockmaker. 
it wasn't a fair fight at all, and that's going to become a focus of this part of the story. But don't count John out just yet, because he has a few tricks up his sleeve. Now, Neville, over here, he's got some powerful friends, including Sir Isaac Newton, who tells the world, he writes, that lunar distance is the only method worth investigating for finding the longitude. And he's, in fact, the the de facto lead of the board of longitude at this point. He's also um, really the lead of the, the community of astronomers. And it's this community of astronomers that has managed to convince the British crown to build the Greenwich Observatory, which is a veritable temple to astronomy. It's a castle in its own right. In fact, the royal astronomers lived in this castle, uh, each of them. And part of the way that they convinced the crown to pay for it is is they told the king, the queen at the time, that if they built the observatory, that they would solve the problem of longitude. So there's a small bit of pressure on these astronomers to actually deliver on that promise. Now, John over here, he didn't travel in too many royal society circles, so perhaps he wasn't quite aware of the fact that Sir Isaac Newton had spoken, and he instead spent five years of his life constructing a sea clock. This is what he made, and I just want to take a moment and let you appreciate just the incredible craftsmanship in this work of of art, really. It is really for clockmaking a turning point in clock and timekeeping mechanisms. It has a completely revolutionary escapement called the grasshopper escapement, which he invented. Certain parts of it are actually made of wood, a special kind of wood that exudes a natural oil. So this clock never needs to be lubricated. It just oils itself as it runs. It doesn't use a pendulum. It uses a complicated set of springs and counterweights in order to take the place of a pendulum so that it could work at sea. What you see here is about half the size of the Harrison sea clock that he built. And um, really an amazing work of art that can still be seen in Greenwich. Harrison built this first sea clock, went to London, stood before the Board of Longitude, and demanded the cross-Atlantic sea trial that was a requirement for claiming the Longitude Prize. They denied him this. Perhaps they just didn't quite trust in this mechanism just yet. So they instead sent him on a sort of pre-trip to Lisbon. So he's disappointed, but he goes to Lisbon with his clock on the boat. He has some problems on the way down, but on the way back, the clock determines the position of the boat far better than the sea captains, far better than the admiral of that fleet is able to accomplish. In fact, it's reported that he saved the fleet from coming to rest upon the Manacles, which is a formation of rocks south of the aptly named Dead Man's Point near the mouth of the English Channel, um, where hundreds of lives and dozens of boats have been lost, even in in, uh, more modern times. This, by the way, was considered too embarrassing to the admiral, and so it is not part of the official record of John's voyage with the sea clock. Now, at this point, it was probably would have been smart for John to say, okay, I'm ready for that cross-ocean sea trial, but he doesn't. He isn't quite satisfied with his clock. And so what do you do when you're not quite satisfied with this amazing machine you built? Well, you take five more years to construct an additional clock. So John builds his second sea clock, which you can see here, um, which has another bevy of enhancements in it, but also a critical flaw, which John discovers after five years of working on it, which would stop the clock from working well when a boat was turning at sea. So he abandons this clock completely and starts to build a third clock. So keep in mind, we've spent five years on the first one, five years on the second one, give or take. How long do you think he spends building the third one? 17 years. John labors to create his third clock, over 17 years of his life, during which, by the way, he was not being paid for this work, but it occupied almost all of his time. All he did on the side was just enough work, clock making, and re- so clock repair, and um, 
a little bit of carpentry, just to make ends meet, but basically lived a, a fairly meager existence during the whole time that he's working on this project. Now, during all of this time, the people pushing the lunar distance method over here really haven't managed to claim the prize themselves. And believe me, they're trying very hard to get there. By this point, the head of the uh, Board of Longitude and the Royal Astronomer is this man, James Bradley. And he uh, <laughs> happens to also be a contender for that prize. In fact, he's quoted as telling Harrison and his son that if it were not for their meddling, he would have already shared the Longitude Prize. So in case you missed that, the head of the Board of Longitude is planning to win the Board of Longitude Prize. So that's a, a bit of a conflict of interest, right? Well, it's going to get a lot worse because at this point, John is demanding that he have the trial of his third sea clock, and Bradley over here uses his position to delay that, and he's delaying it for his friend, Neville Maskelyne, who we introduced at the beginning, because Neville is furiously working to complete the method of lunar distances. Basically, he's compiling tables that would allow this calculation to be performed more quickly by a sea captain. So they hold up the testing of H3. However, I think this backfired just a little bit, because during this delay, shocking, I think everyone, John creates his true masterpiece. In just about four years, he makes that. And you should be saying, what? That doesn't look anything like the thing that we just saw. It looks like a, a big pocket watch. And that's basically what it was. Look at the scroll work in there. It doesn't even look like it's the work of the same person. That huge contraption that we were just looking at has been shrank down to something that's basically a hefty pocket watch. The previous machine, which had to be housed in a, in a special cabinet, kept in a, in a certain cabin on the ship, now it's just this device that a captain could pull out of a drawer and use in the comfort of his cabin. The proponents of the lunar distance method are quite concerned about this, but they're unable to stop the test from proceeding. Only now, it is not H3 that, sorry, the third clock, that is tested, but this one, on a trip to Barbados. So it's actually John's son, William, that goes on this trip to Barbados, and it performs amazingly. It loses only a couple of seconds on a complete ocean voyage. And upon arriving, the captain of the ship is so astonished at how accurately William predicted their landfall that he awards to him, rather ceremoniously, an octant. So an octant is very much like a sextant. And really, this is the award of the vanquished foe, the trophy, of, you know, the trophy for the conqueror. Basically, he's telling William, well, I guess we're not going to need this thing anymore. <laughs> so they're almost to the point of capturing this prize, a huge sum of money, and the glory that comes from doing this. What remains is that a representative from the Board of Longitude meets them in Barbados to perform the calculations, the final measurements, to confirm their achievement. So, what expert is waiting for him there in Barbados when he arrives? None other than Neville Maskelyne. Why is he in Barbados? Because he is there testing the lunar distance method. And he is the guy that is charged with testing whether the clock has accomplished its goal. A little bit distasteful. It gets worse. Neville, by the way, is forced to acknowledge that the clock has worked and sends them back to London, and he heads back to London as well. Now, when he gets back to London, something interesting happens. The royal astronomer dies. A new one is appointed. Who is it? It's Neville! Oh, boy. <laughs> Neville is now the head of the Board of Longitude. He immediately uses his position to change the rules of the Longitude Prize. John is not allowed to win the prize at this point. Instead, he must surrender, by this new order of, of the Board of Longitude, all of the designs for his clock. He has to disassemble it in front of a board of experts, including rival clockmakers of the time. All of those designs, by the way, Neville takes them and publishes them to the world. So imagine your intellectual property taken and just published to the world without your permission. 
By the way, the joke was on Neville there because John happened to be terrible at expressing himself in writing and in diagrams. So <laughs> those designs, though they were published, were indecipherable to <laughs> anyone of the time, and no one could rep- reproduce the work. They did acknowledge, however, that John had been able to do this when he took it apart and put it back together again. They also instructed John that in order to claim the prize, he had to build two more of them. He had to do this without his clocks because... To make it even worse, one day, Neville Maskeline shows up at the door of John Harrison carrying a written order that says, you must surrender all of your clocks to me at once for testing. This is basically outright robbery. John's compelled by law to surrender his clocks. His life's work, he has spent decades building them. While they're being loaded, He steps out of the room for a moment, and oops, one of the workmen that Neville has hired drops one of the clocks, damaging it seriously. Neville takes the clocks away back to London to perform his testing under some ridiculous conditions. You may be feeling that John is being quite poorly used by this arrangement. Thankfully, He wasn't completely alone. He brings his case before none other than King George III. And you know things have gotten bad when you have to get the king involved. King George III is so enraged at the mistreatment of John Harrison that he orders the Board of Longitude to make it right. And what they do is award him most of the money from the Longitude Prize, not all. But they never formally recognize him as the person who has solved this problem. In fact, they dissolve the committee without conferring that honor upon anyone, which is kind of a jerk move. (laughs) All right, I can see it in your eyes right now. You're feeling a little let down, right? I mean, here I told you we're going to have this great story about partnership, I chose this story because it is such an amazing example of the lack of partnership. Now, Neville comes out here as pretty clearly the villain of our story, but I want to say that John didn't help matters tremendously. John insisted on working alone. He trusted no one, even before, you know, the world messed with him. He barely trusted his own son, and only later in his life, he was awful at politics, terrible at selling, struggled to communicate himself in writing. He should not have been working alone. He had the spark of genius, but not the rest of what you need to make that happen. And in doing so, in forcing himself to work alone, he lived a life of, of real struggle. He only you know, won his money in the final years of his life. <clears throat> You might be thinking that these men are just oil and water, that they never could have worked together, but I disagree. Here were two men who could have built one of the greatest partnerships in history because they cared so much about the same problem but had such different backgrounds and training. The master astronomer, the master clockmaker, imagine what they could have built together. Well, I don't have to imagine because it is the union of these approaches that guide all spacecraft today. On the left is a modern star tracker. On the right, the deep space atomic clock, which is about to be launched. Every modern spacecraft uses a combination of celestial navigation and extremely accurate timekeeping in order to measure and measure its position and navigate through space. In fact, we're in the process of launching two new spacecraft to refine each of these methods. So it took a little while, but true reconciliation for John and Neville was really found in the stars. So, that's the end of my first story. But, before we talk more about space, my second story is about aviation. So, it's 200 years later. The Wright brothers just completed their first flight about 20 years ago. And despite that accomplishment, aviation 
is in a time of great vulnerability. Most people look at aviation as a foolhardy, dangerous circus act. And that's not helped by the fact that most people's first encounters with aviation was literally a circus, okay? So a group of barnstormers, they were called, flew from city to city, performing feats like wing walking and parachuting, and uh, basically convincing everyone that only an idiot would ever get aboard a plane, because anyone who would walk on the wing of a flying plane was clearly that. Now, this perception of aviation is a problem for the industry, and a famous hotel owner named Raymond Ortiz decided to change matters with a new prize called the Ortiz Prize. It was a sum of about only $340,000 in today's dollars, so not the same as the Longitude Prize in its size, but the goal of that prize was fly nonstop from New York to Paris across the Atlantic. Now, to explain how unreasonable of a task that seemed to people at the time, I want to show you what an aircraft looked like at about that time. This is the de Havilland Tiger Moth. It is a two-seater, single-engine biplane. And what you're looking at here is made up basically of fabric stretched over wood, held together with a bunch of glue and rope. Not kidding. What kind of an idiot would get into something like that? Well, this one, because interestingly enough, my dad owned a Tiger Moth when I was young, and I flew many, many times in this aircraft. I want to tell you just a little bit of what that felt like. It was about as unlike the modern aviation experience as you could possibly imagine. It was windy, loud. There was no electrical system to speak of on this plane. You started the plane by walking out to the front, grabbing onto the propeller and pulling really hard, and then getting out of the way (laughs) quickly. When it started, it sounded a little bit like this. Sounded exactly like that, actually. That's a Tiger Moth engine which, by the way, sounds a bit like a machine that most of you would not trust to mow your lawn, um, to say nothing of climbing aboard for a flight. (laughs) When you were on board the Tiger Moth, it, it shook and rattled the whole time it was flying. The gauges, the needles were all dancing in front of you. So you sort of were saying, well, we're flying somewhere between 60 and 68 or 70 or something like that. It's somewhere in that you know, smear of needle there. And by the way, it's quite normal in a strong headwind to be flying over a road watching the cars go faster than you as you flew. But it was an amazing experience. It's one that I'll treasure my entire life. One last memory that always brings it back for me is, is that I'm pretty sure every single tiger moth in the world has a leaky fuel tank. And so the whole experience is punctuated by this this tinge of gasoline in the air the whole time that you're flying. It's just a, it's a romantic era of aviation. <laughs> so an earlier model of the uh, de Havilland planes was actually used to deliver the first airmail in the United States. And I have a bit of airmail here today. Um, So, the, uh, one of the first pilots to deliver the airmail, which you can see right here, is actually the, uh, one of the heroes of our second story. And his name is Charles Lindbergh. You may have heard of our friend Lucky Lindy, Charles Lindbergh. Charles actually got his start as a barnstormer, flying from city to city, performing these death-defying feats on airplanes. And he didn't need an introduction to how dangerous aviation was. In fact, when he became an airmail pilot, he probably thought, maybe this will be a little bit safer than walking around on a wing, um, and managed to crash two planes, both times saving his life by jumping out of them with a parachute. In fact, became the first person in history to have his life saved twice by a parachute. 
So a member of the so-called Caterpillar Club twice. This is actually uh, Charles right here. And he looks kind of proud of this mess that he's created. <laughs> um, maybe he's just proud to be alive. Now, in both cases, by the way, after he crashed these planes, he gathered up all the mail and took them to a train station so that the mail could still be deliv delivered to its intended destination. So that was a lot of dedication. Um, now, it's on these long overnight mail flights that Lindbergh gets the idea that he wants to compete for the Ortigue Prize, that he wants to fly from New York to Paris nonstop. And this is <clears throat> pretty bold, considering that Lindbergh basically has never flown over water before. <laughs> He's a complete unknown in the world of aviation, but he had a lot of time to think about it, flying overnight, delivering the mail night after night. Now, he certainly was not going to fly over the Atlantic in a plane like this or like that tiger moth I just showed you. So he scraped together some money from some businessmen in St. Louis to buy a plane. And then heads off to New York with his money in his pocket. Well, check in his pocket. Only problem is no one wants to sell him a plane. See, by this point, the Ortigue Prize, it actually ran out its first five years without anyone even trying. And then it had to be reissued by Ortigue so that people would give it a go. And now, finally, people are trying, and people are expecting this prize is going to be claimed in the not-distant future. So all the airplane manufacturers are sort of jockeying for position because they want to be the plane that does it. The first people he speaks to are willing to sell him the plane but they insist on picking the pilot. And Lindbergh was not the kind of man to allow that. He wanted very much to be the person who accomplished that flight himself. Second company had a problem with Lindbergh's strategy. You see, he had spent all of his time flying these single-engine airplanes, and he wanted to do this ocean crossing in a single-engine plane. Now, a lot of people thought that was nuts, including this aircraft manufacturer, which made both single-engine and multi-engine planes. And uh, they figured, of course, that a multi-engine plane was a better idea because, well, you can get that plane down successfully if one of the engines fails. What Lindbergh realized was that, yes, that was true if you were over land, but if you're over the middle of the Atlantic, a single-engine failing on a multi-engine plane means you're not coming home. There's no way. And so he just figures... It's actually an example of some great risk analysis in the time that a single point of failure is still a single point of failure, and if you multiply it times two or three, you're making matters worse, not better. So they refuse to sell him a single-engine plane because they think it's going to fail, and they don't want their company associated with that failure. So he comes back to St. Louis very dejected and disappointed because he's only got one option left. It's an option he ruled out before, the Ryan Airline, Airplane Company, which is uh, out in California, and he had ruled them out just because they were too small, too unproven. Um, but when he sends a telegram to this man, Donald Hall, asking him, hey, and literally, it's about this short, can you build a plane to fly from New York to Paris in two months? And Donald writes back, sure. Slight paraphrasing. But the telegrams were short, and that's really all there was to it. With that, Lindbergh heads out to California, and uh, we finally have a real partnership to talk about because the partnership of Lindbergh and Hall is a remarkable one. The pilot and the chief engineer of an aircraft company, an airplane designer, working together. So Donald, Donald thinks that he can save some time and meet this schedule by adapting an existing design of a Ryan Air airplane. But as he starts to work on the problem, he realizes that that's just not going to be possible. And he basically redesigns a completely new plane from scratch. And a lot has been said about the endurance of our pilot Charles Lindbergh, especially in his ocean crossing. But Donald Hall, on a couple of occasions, worked for 36 hours at his desk, producing the designs as quickly as he could, 
such that the workmen building the plane could keep working. In fact, I should have a design that he drew here. Now, the funny thing is that a lot of designs really haven't survived, um, mostly because they were working so fast that almost none of the blueprints were actually made into formal blueprints, and they were throwing things out and trying things again so quickly. It's kind of hard to piece together which ones were the ones that they actually followed in the end. Now, he took some core principles from the design of other planes at the Ryan Aircraft plant, but he realized that the goal that he needed to stay focused on was that singular goal of building a plane that could fly from New York to Paris nonstop, and that everything else had to fall aside when that goal was put in front of them. And they did manage to do this. Hall and his team with Lindbergh built, designed and built a completely new plane in the space of two months. Part of the reason why they could stay on schedule like that was that first there was this extreme collocation. These guys literally shared an office for two months, were almost never apart. When they ran into engineering problems, they just leaped over them, like this one. Problem was, is this wing was bigger than anything that they'd ever built before, and it couldn't go out the normal door. And so they were thinking about just knocking the wall down to get the plane wing out, when they noticed that there was a second story window that it could fit out of, and there was a box car down a ways that they could push underneath the window and carry the wing out on top of the box car and then lower it down to the ground with a crane. And you know what? I bet that the decision to do this took about two minutes. There were no meetings. There were no trade analyses. <laughs> Everybody, go push that box car over here. <laughs> we're pulling the wing out the window. They transported the plane in pieces because Ryanair um, was just too small, too fledgling to even be located at an airport. Here is a picture of them actually lofting the wing up and on top of the plane. And way over here on the right is Donald Hall. That's the kind of leader he is. Of course he's there lifting the wing onto his plane. So, let's take a look at the marvelous thing that Donald and his team built. So by many, in many ways, the spirit of St. Louis is a very odd airplane. Let's see if I can stand out here for a second. So first thing I want to point out is it's got a huge, almost awkward wingspan. It had to to carry all of the fuel it was expected to carry. You can see there, it's a, a single engine plane um, at Lindbergh's insistence. And it's got these big gangly struts above it to hold up those giant wings. Because basically every cavity on this plane that can be filled with fuel is filled with fuel. Everything else has been stripped out. So while some of the teams competing for the ET Ortig Prize had things like a refrigerator and a couch inside their plane, not kidding, Lindbergh was to sit on a wicker chair for the entire 34-hour flight. Every instrument that was considered expendable was taken out. Even Lindbergh's parachute was discarded in order to save weight. Lindbergh figured as he had on a couple of occasions, that if he had to bring the plane down, that he could do so and save his life. He did carry a life raft for in case he came down in the Atlantic, um, although I'm not really sure how much use that could have been. If you look at it from this angle, I want to show you another extreme engineering design decision that Hall made. There are no windows in the front of the Spirit of St. Louis. Charles Lindbergh literally cannot see where he is flying without sticking his head out the window, or by using a makeshift periscope that he can stick out the window. And the reason for that is, is that Donald Hall actually considered putting some of the fuel behind Lindbergh as well. 
and that would have allowed for a small window, not much, but a small window above the front fuel tank. Lindbergh didn't want to have that because, without being too graphic, he had seen what happened when a pilot became trapped between the engine of the plane and a heavy fuel tank in a crash. He didn't want anything to do with that. So he literally uh, you know, had to stick his head out if he wanted to see where he was flying or look down through the window if he wanted to new, uh, see the ground below him or the ocean below him. So this, in many ways, is not a comfortable plane to fly. You'll notice that there weren't planes that looked like the Spirit of St. Louis after the prize were won. It is an example of single-minded engineering, one purpose and one person alone, purpose alone, where everyone else was trying to make a plane been designed for other things, also make this flight at this time, this team understood that engineering a solution to solve the problem was what was going to win the prize. And they also understood how to make a partnership that could make that possible. So let's send, send that plane away. Now, a lot has been written and said about Charles Lindbergh's voyage across the Atlantic. I'm not going to talk about that today. I want to talk about what happened when he came back home. <clears throat> so Charles, when he returns home, without exaggeration, is basically the most famous man on earth. Everywhere he goes, he is met with parades. This one in New York. Everywhere he goes, medals are pinned on his chest. People want to either marry him or be him. Lindbergh, think of him as the Neil Armstrong of his era. And as we're looking at all of these amazing scenes of millions of people who turned out to see him, what is missing? Rather, who is missing? Where is Donald? Where is the man who built the plane? Because let's just agree for a moment that there is no way that Charles Lindbergh could have built the spirit of St. Louis. And at least half of this achievement of the first ocean crossing was an engineering achievement. Yes, Lindbergh deserves credit for being this amazing pilot, for leading the project. But Donald Hall deserved a great deal of credit too. And he's absent. It wasn't that he didn't want to be famous. Everybody wants to be famous. It's just that the world seemed to only be able to tolerate one hero. And that hero was Charles Lindbergh. Now, I'll say that Charles didn't really help matters all that much. I want to show you this postcard here. And I want you to read here. It says, our hero, Captain Charles Lindbergh, at the bottom we did it. Oh, you're thinking, he's giving credit to Donald. Nope, he's talking about him and the plane. <laughs> he even wrote a book. The name of the book was We, but We was him and his plane. It's as if he's talking about a horse, some horse that he found and he raised from a colt. And, you know, so me and my trusty steed, who I just happened to find somewhere, like we're heading out across the Atlantic. What about the guy who built it? Now, Donald, he didn't have a, a bad life. He stayed in touch with his friend. He was a moderately successful aircraft engineer for the rest of his life. He was laid off from a later company that he worked for, and then got another job. He was not the head of his own aircraft company. He was not a, celebr a celebrity the way that Lindbergh was. All right, so I can see it in your eyes again. I've let you down again, haven't I? Where is our story of partnership of, of two people who came together, accomplished something great, and then ride off into the sunset together? Well, this was a great partnership. There is no way this could have been accomplished without both of these men working together. And by the way, all of the men and women who supported them in building the actual aircraft. However, this is not a movie. And partnerships don't always end in a just and equitable and even division of credit. Now, when we build partnerships, we should try to make that happen. And Lindbergh could have done much, much better. And I will say that while Donald didn't experience the joys of fame, he was also spared some of the horrors while Lindbergh was not when something very dear was taken from him. 
and we won't dwell on that part of the story this morning. If credit and the division of it is chief on your mind as you form a new partnership, then it's doomed. Now, before we wrap this story, I will just show you the check that Charles Lindbergh received when he completed his flight from Raymond Ortiz. And by the way, I have to feel a little bit bad for Charles because he must have had to stand there for a really long time while Raymond wrote this check. <laughs> I mean, for goodness sakes, a few doodles, right? <laughs> this is the, uh, the second prize that we've talked about today. Uh, the third prize um, that comes to mind, which was inspired by Lindbergh's uh, prize, by Ortiz's prize, is the Ansari X Prize. And that was created to encourage the development of commercial spaceflight. And that is a fitting transition for us to the third part of our talk, and the last story. And this story's mine. And it's about uh, another invention, but I wanna be careful here because I've just talked about John Harrison and Charles Lindbergh and by putting myself at the end of this talk, I really don't want you to get the impression that I think my achievements are the equal of the gentleman who I've talked about already. It's a story that I know very well and I think is pertinent to the topic, nothing more. However, I will say, if you'll permit me, that while Lindbergh did manage to land the spirit of St. Louis in the Smithsonian, my spirit is on Mars. <laughs> so in case... For those of you who don't get the bad joke, this is the Spirit Mars rover, um, and it landed in Gale Crater in 2004. And I developed uh, part of the operation system that uh, operated this rover and its sister uh, opportunity, and then uh, I led the development of the system that controls Curiosity today, and a lot of other robots. And um, I served on the operations team for Spirit for a while, helping on the day-to-day -day process of deciding where the rover would go and accomplishing those tasks. The whole time I did that, um, observations were brewing in my mind about the nature of the problem we were trying to solve. And it brought me and my team to a, an observation that has really characterized our work of the past few years. And it begins with this observation, which is that we know how humans explore. They do it all the time here on Earth. We explore by going places, by being present in them. All of us are endowed with this amazing ability that allows us to just understand our surroundings in a glimpse, in just a moment. However, when we ask people to explore another planet, this is how they do it. They peer at little pictures on a screen. And it gets worse because they actually do this as a group, and so they're all forming different mental models of the environment that they're exploring, models that we've proven through a carefully controlled study that are flawed. And then they come together and try to talk about those models. This isn't what we want. We want this. We want people to be able to use those same abilities that they honed by being explorers on Earth to explore other planets. But when you think about the problem that's before us to accomplish that, it's mind-boggling. There's this torrent of pictures coming down to us from our vehicle. And we've got to somehow put together this, this picture, this, this view of our world. We do things like we make maps and projections of the images. Sometimes we make little 3D renderings that we look at in, on the computer. But mostly we look at pictures like this. This is a 360 degree panorama taken by the Spirit Mars rover uh, in an area called the Husband Hills. And I want you guys to perform a little experiment with me right now. I want you to imagine that you're an astronaut standing on Mars. You're Matt Damon on Mars. <laughs> over there on, on the left side of the screen. And what you want to do is you want to, maybe because you got to go and pick up pieces to repair your habitat, you got to walk over there, all the way over there. Now, I want you to imagine in your mind what path you would take to get between those points. I mean, would you sort of walk up you know, around the rover and head over there. It looks like a pretty reasonable place, but if you did that, you would look even more ridiculous than the dust storm that was occurring at the beginning of that movie, which, because you'd be walk, turning around and walking the wrong way. The fastest path is just to walk this way, because those two points are right beside each other. 
I told you it was a 360 degree image, to be fair, okay? And there is a clue in the bottom, which is that the rover looks kind of weird, right? But something about this picture just makes your mind just say, yup, I'm just looking out a window and I'm just seeing this place on Mars and there's hills and rocks and there's nothing really recognizable that would make you think that there's something weird. By the way, unless you were quite big, you'd actually look like that. And unless you somehow grew along the way, you'd be about that size over there. So my point here is, is I've deprived you of all senses of reference, points of reference, of things that would allow you to understand scale or shape of the environment. If I were to show you a picture of a more familiar place, this is just an intersection in New York, using the exact same projection, you could tell that something was wrong, but I would suggest that you're still going to have trouble figuring things out. So imagine if you are here and you want to make your way over there. Imagine in your mind the path that you would take to, to accomplish that. And it's just another trick, of course, because you're on that street already. All you have to do is just walk in a straight line. There, it, it's just one intersection. It doesn't get better if things are moving, in case you're wondering, because you know, here you are out snowboarding with your friend and he's gonna do something a little weird. <laughs> That's quite a trick. Maybe if you stand still, nope, still weird. Problem is, is that our brains are just not designed to work this way. So, what was my team going to do? We wanted to make people feel more present in the environments that they're exploring, but what industry could we look to to help us do that? Well, what is another industry built to make you feel like you are somewhere else? Oh, this is just a video of me out snowboarding. Um, I love it when I do that, right? <laughs> so, this is obviously some, some game. Um, but I want to point out that video games have been designed to make you feel like you're somewhere else, to immerse you in another environment. And so it was the perfect industry for my team to reach out to and form really a series of an amazing partnerships. And those partnerships began with actually different kinds of input devices. We started picking up <clears throat> pretty much every joystick, every controller, and driving giant robots with it that we possibly could. Um, and that was, was great, but really what we were after was not just natural input, but awareness of an environment. So I want to show you something real quick, just a quick illustration. So this is just a video of a, of a roller coaster, and we're going to start moving uh, down the, the good part of the roller coaster here in a second. By the way, I don't know where this is, but I really need to go here because that is an incredible view. So. Do you feel like you're on this roller coaster? Do you feel any sense of immersion? Is your stomach doing anything a little bit funny? What about right now? I bet you just felt something a little different. And it's really just a great illustration of how utterly simplistic our brains are. That just by covering a little bit more of the visual field of your retina, that you can change the sense of immersion. By the way, let's go just the next step further. Let's not just make a bigger screen. Let's put the screen all around you and let's have it be someone who's a little scared of roller coasters. So what I love about this video and ones like it, and by the way, his son, her son's going to come in and, and comfort her in just a second. It's okay, mom. You're not going to die. So this is a grown woman. She's a reasonable person. She knows she's not on a roller coaster. This guy, I'm sure his friends, by the way, were like, it's fun, just try it out, it's great. So he literally ends up on the floor uh, in a moment. It's great to have friends like that, right? Get this thing off me, he says at the end. So what we realized is that if you could terrify reasonable, grown human beings by putting them at no physical risk whatsoever, that there was something very powerful happening here that we could use for our own work. And so we did. We've worked with just about anything that you can strap to your face to look at another place. So starting with the Oculus, and it was actually with the Oculus Rift that we uh, did our first experiment, which showed dramatic improvements in understanding environments this way. Uh, this is some old work now, but this shows where we started. And even with this what is now a somewhat crude rendering of the environment around curiosity, people could understand distances and angles far better than they were ever, ever able to before, measurably better. We moved and tried lots of other devices, and we're still working with all of these today. Uh, here is an experience that we built in collaboration with the Sony Corporation. 
And it's a bit of a grainy capture because this is the warped capture from inside the headset. And then a collaboration with Microsoft around the HoloLens. So our partnership with Microsoft goes back quite a ways, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit more because it's this partnership that led to something that we were finally able to publicly announce back in January, and that is the OnSite tool. And OnSite is a tool that we are now using in mission operations for the Curiosity rover to control its day-to-day uh, -day activities. So t a group of scientists on the mission are using it almost every day now. And this is, by the way, what it really looks like. Now, there's some green screening going on there, but this is just a direct screen grab. Um, so our renderings of Mars have come a long way. Um, and this, we feel, has allowed us to achieve really a, a transformative step in the ways that we're exploring. And it is only made possible because of the partnership that we formed. I'm going to say a few words about how we went around building that partnership. So, when we first saw the HoloLens, and you know, my, I have a friendship now and collaboration with Alex Kipman that goes back about seven years, in fact. But when he finally showed us the, the HoloLens, and it was still in a lab, and it looked like just a, a big mess of wires and, and stuff, we saw there a possibility that got us so excited that we just had to do something with it right away. I literally went into the office of the associate director at JPL and said, I need money and I need it next week. And to his credit, he said, okay. Because what I did is I took a, a significant portion of my team and we moved to Redmond and lived there for two months. And there's some interesting parallels here with the story of the Spirit of St. Louis that I just told. And it is because of that intense co-location that we could do something in two months. And by the way, that video, this video you're seeing here, is two months of work of our combined teams. We could do that only by bringing that team all together. Now, when you uproot your team and fly them to live in Redmond for two months, you need to think about how that team is going to function in that time. And we were inspired by a story that we had read about how a team at eBay had completely redesigned the eBay front page as a small team sequestered off in a hotel somewhere in Australia, I think. So we realized that there needed to be kind of a, a sense of family and camaraderie within our team. So we rented a house and we lived and cooked we lived with each other, cooked for each other, lived together in that house the whole time we were up there. It also became a place that we could bring our friends and coworkers from Microsoft together with us. We, we had poker games and got together for barbecues and, and celebrated together. And we basically compressed what normally takes years to build into just a, a week or two in order to, to build the connections that would allow this team to work so quickly, to allow us to come in on that next Monday morning and say, this isn't going to work, we've got to change directions, or I like that you worked so hard on this, but it's not enough, and have it be okay. You can't say that to somebody that you just met. You can say it to someone that you feel like you've known for years, and that's how we felt very quickly because of all these measures we were taking to, to put this team together. Now, there's something about moonshots, about these crazy ideas that just set a team on fire. And one thing that it allowed us to do was to do something that I don't think that could be done at any other speed. Like, I'm not sure the Spirit of St. Louis could have been built in five months. I think in some ways, two months was the reason why they could build it. Because it forced them not just to work long hours, yeah, okay, deadlines make you do that, but to make decisions and compromises at the right places, to not get stuck down a rabbit hole that you think you've got time for when you don't. Because at two months, when you're trying to do something that people say is impossible in the time that you have allotted to you, then you are forced to drop things when you should. You are forced to make the hard decisions when you should, as opposed to be given, frankly, too much money or too much time. The other thing that characterized this partnership is that we each brought something to it that the others didn't have. Microsoft had a, an expertise in human interactive systems that had been honed on building games and devices and software that people use for many, many years. We brought the expertise about space exploration that they didn't have. 
And it's those two perspectives that could be aligned for a single goal that, that created this project, and only that. It's also that we were able to do this without exchanging any money, something I've said openly before. So we didn't pay them, and they didn't license anything from us. And I want to encourage you to think about this. When you try to go form a new partnership, look at all of the knobs that you can turn, because money is only one of them. And if you just fix that one in one place and then fiddle with all the other knobs, you might be able to make a partnership that doesn't actually have to exchange money. And if you can, man, does it make the paperwork easier. (laughs) No joke, because we were able to start this project with basically almost no legal encumberment. There was just a very simple agreement in place. Lawyers got involved later, but... (laughs) You know, when I look at the Spirit of St. Louis and how they built it, they didn't start with weeks of legal negotiation. They started by building an airplane. So I have to include here, conclude here. And I want, as you guys continue through this conference, and you go and you learn about a lot of awesome software technologies, a lot of things that you just you wouldn't be exposed to otherwise. Also think about who you're meeting here. And think about them not just as a person to shake hands with and say hi and maybe see you at the next one. Think about what they know that you don't. Think about what they're doing that you're not doing and how you might be able to think about doing those things together. Because if I can find a way to bring a video game development team together with a space exploration team, then I'm sure that there are many, many alliances waiting to be made here. And I wish you all the best for that. Thanks for your attention.